Hey everyone and welcome back to one of our development streams here where we do firmware, we work on the Orboot project and currently on the RISC-V instruction set architecture and we're working with a development board called the Vision 5.2 which we will come back to in a bit. Uh, but first I would like to say that uh, we are now listed on the RISC-V website and that is in this landscape here. So this is now at landscape.risc5.org and this is where they are listing essentially everything which is working with or around RISC-V in their ecosystem and so on. As you can see here, it's a quite, quite a long listing actually. Um, they took that from, I think, the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, who also have a similar listing, uh, just with uh, slightly different groupings. And what they list here is like all the different projects you may have heard of or companies and so on. So up here, uh, let me zoom in a bit. Um, up here we have applications. Well, they actually also have a zoom option here, but I'm using my browsers for now. So this here is applications like, I don't know, a Apache Software Foundation, for example, makes many different ones. There is MySQL here, LibreOffice, you know, many different applications that are already supported to run on RISC-V. There could be many more, actually, and they even called for, uh, you know, contributing your project to this website if you want to be listed. Uh, there are libraries, uh, very famous libraries like OpenBLAST, for example, it's a library for uh, linear algebra, the LA is actually for linear algebra. Uh, uh, Opus, I think that is the audio codec here. Uh, something from PerfX Lab. They also make certain libraries. I'm not sure what exactly, to be honest. OpenSSL, you may know that from, uh, you know, cryptography for everything that is for, uh, you know, end-to-end -end connections, like with your web browser, for example, that you can, you know, uh, see this um, tiny padlock here. Uh, then we have Sager, they make uh, libraries and stuff for debugging, PyTorch, and so on. Then there is runtimes like PHP, for example. Um, this here would be Python and a few others again. And then further on the left, we have infrastructure. Um, there is Go. I'm not sure why Go is here. Uh, there is Docker. Uh, then we have uh, operating systems like Android, for example, Slackware, FreeBSD, Zephyr, and all these many operating systems, um, OpenBSD, Linux, OpenSUSE, like, you know, everything you may imagine. And now comes the interesting part uh, where you will find our project. So under this section here called boot, there is already BBL that was their first bootloader, actually. Uh, it's short for Berkeley Bootloader. Uh, that's the BBL. Uh, so RISC-V is an instruction set coming from people from Berkeley. It was their fifth edition of a, a RISC architecture, hence the name. This is what they started with. And one of the earliest uh, projects to also support RISC-V was back then Coreboot. That is what we forked Orboot from eventually. And lo and behold, Orboot is now also listed here on the website. Um, next to us are also... Uh, the U-Boot project that we already uh, know very well now, we are using it for reference. Uh, then we have OpenSBI, the you know famous SBI library, like one of the uh, main implementations. Uh, this year is, it is the Rust gear logo, but it's actually for Rust SBI. Um, yeah, th there is actually no, uh, no hint yet here. Uh, they could add that maybe. Uh, there is also a different view. We can look at that in a bit. Then Tiano Core, UFI, you know, and then lots of other tools like compilers, hypervisors, services, what, whatever you may need. And of course, the board and chip makers uh, like Sci5, they are the ones making the core uh, or the cores that we use on our processors here. So currently we're using a, a Star5 uh, processor. This here is uh, Star5 themselves. Uh, they make an SOC based on cores from Sci5. It's called the JH7110. And uh, then we have All Winner. They made very, very nice boards and also chips. So they made one of the very first uh, RISC V uh, processors and boards also. That was the All Winner D1. A very, very nice board. I also work with a lot. Uh, well, and then we have Mango Pi. They also made boards based on the All Winner D1 SOC. Uh, well, and then we have chips here. Uh, th there could be some more vendors also added over time. Um, 
For example, of course, as perceived, they are also making uh, RISC-V chips. All right, so let's zoom out a bit again here. Uh, and let's look at the card mode. So this is where you can actually see, you know, a brief description of all the projects like Berkeley Bootloader down here. And this is now just sorted by alphabet. It's not uh, grouped anymore. So you would see, uh, what would Orbit be under O? Or is it still categorized? Hang on, you can just search for it. So there is Orbit right here. Yeah, it's just alphabetically sorted. So yeah, if you want to see something more, you can just click on one of those cards and then you see like the repository and so on, the stars on GitHub, etc. Um, the first commit here, it says 20 years ago, but you know, that is because we actually forked from Corboot and Corboot is already 20 years old by now, right? Yeah, the latest commit to the main branch was two months ago and that is about as long as it took us now to finally get the DRAM initialization to work. And that is what I want to focus on today. So yeah, I will switch to that uh, in a bit. Uh, but before that, I would like to highlight another event that just happened very recently. And that is what I went to Canada for. And that was the ninth international workshop on Plan 9. Plan 9, the famous operating system with Glenda, the bunny mascot, also not yet listed on that side. Uh, we can actually uh, also contribute that at some point. Um, I will see about that. Uh, there is uh, a GitHub page where you can, you know, there is like you can create an issue and then they will add the project. So yeah, and in our program down here, um, we actually had a paper from Jeff Collier on Plan 9 on the RISC-V 64-bit platforms. Uh, so yeah, Jeff was writing about, you know, different uh, SOCs, how they like differ, uh, how they were, you know, uh, how easy or cumbersome they were to work with and stuff like that. Uh, that was quite an interesting talk. And well, we still have uh, some projects um, which are also related to Plan 9, like the R9 project, for example, it is something uh, that I also contribute to. Um, that we also want to get running on a RISC-V platform at some point. Anyway, um, we will get back to that uh, at some point, I guess. So what I want to do today is I want to take a look at the DRAM initialization again. So let's switch over to my terminal again, uh, where we have our editor already open. This here is the main file uh, in the Orboot port for the JH7110 SOC. That is the one on the Vision 5 board, so the Vision 5.2 in this instance. And uh, well, there is this function here that I added, the DRAM init function. We already talked about this in previous streams, um, but yeah, it was uh, quite some code to translate. And to be honest, it was very confusing. Um, and that took me quite a while to adapt then. The interesting bit is, it is actually the same DRAM controller on uh, this chip as on the predecessor. So the JH7100 had the very, very same controller. It was just using some different values. And the uh, blocks of the controller were at you know different uh, ranges in the memory. So technically, I could also have used the old code again and made some adjustments there. Um, but I actually saw some patterns which were really nice in uh, the new implementation that Star5 did for this SLC. So I wanted to adapt that. And well, then I went into a few uh, issues there. <laughs> I got uh, quite a few things wrong here and there, uh, but we're finally there now. So yeah, um, before we look too deep into that, let us actually have a quick run. Uh, let's quickly walk through uh, this main function here and then see the machine boot. So the first things that are being done here is setting up two uh, of the PLLs. So you will need to know that on the SOC, there are different clock sources. So there is one main source, and that is a 24 megahertz external clock. And from that one, we would derive other clocks. There is PLL 0, 1, and 2. PLL 0 and 2 is what we now set the frequencies for here in this instance. And PLL1 is what is routed to the DRAM controller. Well, and that is what we set up later in this DRAM init function down here. But before we do that, um, we actually do these two things here. 
this is where we switch the PLL for the uh, clock CPU route and then for the bus route. So we will uh, quickly take a look at that as well. Um, so this essentially uh, tells them to, you know, not use anything, uh, uh, but, you know, what is assigned in here. And I will uh, show that in a bit. And then there are some other configurations. So if you look at the uh, clock tree, we'll look at that in a bit. And you will see that, uh, you know, each and every uh, part of the SOC, the so-called peripherals, they all somehow derive their clocks and then you can set up specific dividers. You can enable each and every one of those peripherals. And that is how you actually get very, very power efficient uh, chips today because it allows for, you know, clocking things down, turning things off that you don't need and things like that. You need a, a, a few other ingredients for that, of course, but yeah, that's essentially it. Um, I also copied this here over from the uh, U-boot code that we uh, looked at. So this is just setting the GPIO voltage. It should be set to three volts by default, but yeah, nevertheless, um, I, I think it's a sensible thing to do. Again, I commented out this part here that was for, you know, blinking an LED. We don't really need that right now. It was my first indicator for, uh, you know, code to be running. Um, then here, uh, this is already the setup for the serial. So here we enable the um, uh, the GPI opens that we need for it. Uh, then we initialize the serial. Uh, then we initialize our logger and we already do our first print. We print the boot mode that is telling us that we are booting from UART. That's what we're doing all the time currently. Then we print the IDs from, uh, you know, risk five. There are different IDs for uh, identifying the platform, the vendor and so on. Well, then we do this, this little thing here. Um, this is another clock setup. We actually really don't need this here at this instance. Uh, I, I put that comment here also for reference. Um, I, th I thought I had to, but yeah, whatever. It's, it's still in here currently. There are some things I haven't really cleaned up yet at this point, but anyway, after all this uh, stuff here with the clocks and um, having the serial available, we then set up the DRAM and that is quite an involved task. But once we have it, we can start using it. So yeah, in the instructions below, I would, you know, copy the payload and then, you know, continue doing things. And now let's um, give that a little shot. So I will now turn on the power supply here to the board and I will run our commands to, you know, build and uh, transfer our code, run it and then open a serial. So we will use picocom here uh, so that we get the output immediately after, you know, triggering uh, running the code. So yeah, uh, it takes a second to transfer everything. And there we go. It is already running and uh, I'm just turning it off again right now. And now let us quickly recap what happened here. So first of all, um, this is from where the terminal started, right? So the first thing is we print this nice message or boot uh, the crab emoji. Then we tell the boot mode, the UART and everything else. We had already seen this before. And now comes the interesting part this year. Um, well, this here is something we still need to figure out. Uh, it is in fact four gigabytes that I have on my board here. Uh, I'm currently printing uh, DRM 4G faults. This is something um, that I'm trying to pass down into the compile process as a configuration parameter. I'm not exactly sure why it doesn't work in this instance. I got it to work in another project setup, but yeah, nevertheless. So I just hard coded that at some other point in the code currently, and that's okay for a start. So this is where the DRAM initialization starts. And for starting it, well, one of the first things to do is we clock down again. So we, we set the clock to the DRAM controller down to the oscillator, that is the 24 megahertz I just mentioned, divided by two. And now I think this is a good point to actually have a look at the manual again, because this is showing us the structure and then we can kind of make sense of all of this happening here. So here we go. Up here, you see the clock sources. Up here is OSC, the oscillator. This is a 24 megahertz part. It goes down here as well. This is really just, you know, to uh, get all those lines in a, uh, you know, in a nice arrangement. Here it says OSC 24M, M for megahertz. 
So this is the golden line down here. And if you follow it, you can see it's actually running into various places. And you see it's getting in here. This is clock bus root. You recall that was one of the things that we changed in our code. So we configured that to not be uh, OSC 24M actually, but we're using PLL2 instead. Um, then we have the derived clock. So we have PLL2, 1, and 0. Now let's follow the line that is going down to the DRAM controller. So how do we do that? We start, well, down here. This is where we have DDRC and DDR5. So these are actually two separate blocks, but you know they <laughs> need to collaborate together. So they are driven by, uh, well, you can see three clock inputs. There is one which is called APB12. APB is the um, advanced peripheral bus, I think, um, that is fixed. So this is running at 51.2 megahertz. I'm not sure what it's used for, to be honest. Then there is this bypass thing here. It says 1066M. And then there is the DDR bus clock, which is, uh, it needs to be set to 533 megahertz. And how does that work? Well, you have those inputs here. And so there is some point where you can choose whether you would want to use the clock, the oscillator divided by two, or one of those here, which is the DDR root clock divided by two, four, or eight. And this is happening in the code that we're looking at right now. So the last thing we just uh, saw in the code was this here, oscillator divided by two assigned as the DDR clock. So let's look at the code very uh, well, the output very quickly again. It's setting the clock to oscillator divided by two. And this is necessary for uh, setting up the PLL frequency. So the PLL is now PLL1 that we're going to set up. These are the original uh, values in the registers for the PLL. So it's configured actually, uh, you know, via like seven or eight different values that you would need to set in you know, a range of registers. So three registers. Now this is the original value, well, values, three. And we then set them to those values. And when done, well, we set the clock again, and now it's set to PLL divided by two. And we set the PLL frequency so that it matches the DRAM part. So DRAM parts, you know, they run at different clock speeds. Sometimes you can also run them at like, you know, certain like higher or uh, lower clock rates. Um, so essentially what I'm doing here, because I don't actually have, you know, uh, there is not too much documentation on exactly what the values um, mean or, you know, how to like configure different options or something. It's a, it's a bit complicated. So I'm really just using the same code as in U-Boot. Uh, there are different options in U-Boot, but we're just using the one that is also used, uh, you know, uh, in their current code actually. Um, then some asserts are happening. So asserts are doing the following. Um, if you look at this here again, so you have all of these clocks coming in here and they all need to stay in sync, right? And what the reset is doing, well, the assert, <laughs> we're, we're doing essentially a, a reset of those clocks here. And by that, we're uh, setting it so that, you know, uh, everything that is following down the tree here can be realigned. So yeah, that is this part. Now here's something, uh, it says train. It's not actually training at this point. Um, it is writing some data that is necessary for training. Same with this util thing. And here I really just retained the wording that we already had in the U-boot code or also in the previous SOCs code. So I sort of, you know, um, put things together a bit so that we, you know, can make a bit more sense of it because the previous implementation for the predecessor SOC, it actually had quite some comments and made things quite understandable. If you were, you know, willing to spend all the time to understand everything, that was really quite a bit to digest, to be honest. Well, then there is this here called start and that eventually triggers something. It says, hey, we're now ready, uh, you know, to get going then we're setting the clock down again and then there is this thing called boot and this is actually well 
it's not like um, you know, like it's not like we're booting a system here or something, at least not to my understanding. Uh, but we're re uh, triggering something again in the uh, DRAM controller here. And this is where we come to this part, OMC. OMC being short for Orbit Memory Controller. It's just the product name of the controller that uh, Star5 uh, bought and they're using here. And that consists of a few parts. Um, there are multiple chunks of configuration written to you know various spots in uh, in the configuration space. There is like you know different uh, blocks actually. We will also look at that in a bit. Um, then then there are some timings necessary here, and then there is some some voltages that need to be set gradually, uh, and then the actual training happenings in this training phase. Well, we are uh, sort of talking to the DRAM controller. And we're asking it, hey, is this now the right clock rate that we need to set? And then depending on the answer, we would set a higher clock rate or maybe a lower one. You know, it, it depends on the response. Then, well, there is some data that still needs to be written to the phi eventually. Uh, that is actually also happening here uh, a bit. And then we are eventually done. This is where the whole initialization process of the DRAM controller is done. And then we can copy our payload well, that just takes a short while because currently we're not copying much. Uh, I put a compressed Linux kernel already in Flash. Um, it looks like this here. It starts with 9, 0, and so on. Um, it, it's not too exciting. This was just for me to verify that it's actually in there. And well, and then we are jumping to a payload. Well, and we release the other heart, of course. So we just run on the uh, first heart, the monitor heart that is called S0. And uh, well, when we actually want to run our payload, we also need to release all the other hearts. So we need to wake them up. And uh, yeah, that is what is happening here. Now you see this output, it says U-boot 2021 and so on, December 19. Um, and then it's printing the CPU, uh, the model, and well, DRAM, and that is where it stops actually. So what happened here? What I did here was, uh, b besides Linux, I also copied the um, uh, the U-boot that still resides here in the flash. It doesn't occupy all the space. I copy that also to DRAM and then just jump to it. So that is what is now printing this information here. It doesn't know anything about the DRAM though, uh, because we're not passing on that information. We don't really have to because we don't really want to use this U-boot here. I just use it for recovery purposes. So when I, um, you know, when I set the switches here on the board, then I could still run U-boot in, instead of our own code. So for example, to load a Linux kernel and verify things and so on, or maybe also do other experiments. And for development, I would set the switches back again, and then I would load our own code via UART. So in the uh, next steps, I will implement uh, Rust SBI for, you know, this SOC here now. And when I'm done with that, I can jump to the uh, Linux kernel actually, so I can I can decompress that to memory again, and then jump right to it. But before that, we need to set up SBI, because that is what Linux actually expects to be able to talk to, because Linux wants to run in S mode, the supervisor mode, and we have our code that is running in the machine mode, the Rust, uh, the uh, Risk Five M mode for short, and yeah. That is uh, something still on the agenda. Anyway, so this is how far we are right now. And now let's have a closer look again at all the code and have a bit of a walkthrough through the madness of the DRAM in it because it's really quite a bit. So I will just jump to that function here. And you see there are still some remaining to-dos, uh, but whatever. So yeah, this is what you saw, right? You saw those uh, print statements here. You saw me printing DRAM 4G and I was just saying false. So this is the config macro. I'm not sure why, you know, my config is currently not appearing. I'm passing it, but yeah, whatever. Something to figure out later. So yeah, all of this here can uh, rather be ignored right now. Um, then we do a few more prints. And the first thing we then do is setting down the clock to oscillator divided by two. Now let's have a quick look how that actually works. So to set the oscillator divided by two to be the DDR controller's clock. Well, 
we read from the register, which is the DDR bus uh, clock configuration register, we apply a mask to it, and then we write back an updated value. And the updated value is, well, we just or it with DDR bus oscillator divided by two. Uh, what is that value? Well, it is actually just zero, like this here. Right, so essentially we were just uh, clearing this. We, we could also omit this if we wanted, but you know, this is really just for clarity. Now, what is uh, this register here? How is that defined? So this is the, uh, here, there. This is a system control register, uh, one of these CRG registers, and it's as at offset AC. And how do we actually know this? So, well, I translated it from the code in U-Boot, uh, but we can also look at the manual again, and let's quickly do that. So let us look further down here. This is where we have the system control registers. And well, you see quite a few things here. And one of them is the uh, clock for DDRC. So we, we could try to follow this here, uh, or we just trust our intuition. We just go to wherever AC would be, roughly down here. Uh, how about this one? So, <laughs> yeah, I, I sort of already looked here. So this is clock DDR bus. That's what they call it. Uh, DDR or DDRC. It's it's a bit um, confusing sometimes how they name things. Anyway, so let me zoom out again here a bit. Um, this is now the documentation for this register. So first of all, this register is an offset AC. It's hex AC. I'm not sure why they put the 16 in here. Um, hex is just, you know, base 16. I guess that is what they mean by that. Um, these are the bits that are uh, existing in the register. So, uh, well, most of them are actually reserved. And from bit 24 to 29, this is where you can select the clock. So they call it MUX, that is uh, short for multiplexing. And well, the multiplexing selectors are, according to their documentation, the oscillator divided by two, the PLL1 divided by four, or the PLL1 divided by eight. But that is actually not really correct. So if you look at the U-boot code, there is a fourth option. And the fourth option is, you can also set this to clock PLL1 divided by two. So yeah. Uh, it's, it's a bit strange why they are using six bits for it because you know you really just need two bits for having four states so with six bits you can <laughs> you can have two to the six so that would be 64 uh, different states that isn't really necessary here um, but whatever you know we, we just accept it we don't really want to discuss their design here um, it was just something you know that was sometimes surprising me so if we look at this here again uh, where uh, you know where the uh, register is used. Now we're applying a mask to it. So this mask here is defined as well the negation of 3f and then lots of zeros. So what is 3? Three? 3 is just if you uh, if you look at each of these digits here, each digit is for 4 bits, right? Now if we want to write 3 in binary, we would get 1, 1. And we if we take the preceding zeros, it would be uh, essentially zero, uh, sorry, zero, zero, one, one, right? So what does F mean? F means, means all the bits are set. So that would be like one, 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 one. Well, and then comes zero, 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 zero. And then, you know, for the uh, second half here, so we have the separator in Rust, which is really nice. So you can, you know, group things a bit more. Uh, so now we would have lots of zeros again, just, you know, all, all the zeros. So we would need another uh, another four like this. So this is now the mask that we are applying. And these are exactly the bits that we need. So these are the bits 24, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So yeah, I also put a comment up here. Um, it's what you uh, just saw in the data sheet, or well, in the menu rather. Now, what do we do here? We do a negation. Why do we do a negation? Well, we actually want to have the inverse mask. So not really the inverse mask, but the mask is actually um, telling us what we want to retain. And we want to retain exactly everything but the bits that we want to overwrite, right? So we actually set those here to zero. We apply the mask by using the AND operator. So we are clearing uh, everything but 
those two and all those other bits here, right? So these are now definitely set to zero after applying the mask. Well, and now you may also already have seen uh, uh, that we have four different functions here and that is just to uh, provide the four different options. So yeah, uh, this here, uh, which is not mentioned in the manual, is for PLL1 divided by two. All right, now let's get back to our DDR init code here. Now that we have uh, set this lower frequency, uh, we do this uh, configuration. Um, yeah, I also had a low speed configuration. I took that from an, uh, uh, like an older version uh, from the uh, U-boot code. So, you know, I went down through some older commits. Um, that didn't even work, actually. Uh, I would have needed to also set a different PLL1 uh, frequency, like or maybe some other bits different, I'm not sure. So we can actually remove this already. So while we're talking here, <laughs> I'm already cleaning up a few bits now. All right, so now there is a short delay that was also in the U-boot code. Um, like, I think that is just necessary when you, uh, you know, change the uh, clock speed. Um, right, and then we, uh, well, the PLL clock speed. Now we set the uh, DDR, uh, DDR controller again. And now we set it to PLL1 divided by two. So this is actually the option that isn't documented in the manual. Like, you know, it's, um, I think they just missed it, uh, but it's in the U-boot code. So yeah, this is what we're doing. So what we had, if you will um, look at the uh, diagram again, uh, then, we, then we can see what that actually means now. So. That was the uh, clock structure here, there. So let's zoom in a bit and take a closer look at the DDR blocks. So with the first setting, we're setting clock oscillator divided by two. Now with the other setting, we're setting to PLL1 divided by two. So that is the one that is now selected. So this here is the MUX, the multiplexer. So this is where we choose which of those four options to use. All right. So yeah, continuing with the code, um, this is where the resets are happening. So this is the asserts I talked about. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail right here. Um, this is applying just, you know, two or three different buses. This year is the, uh, or, or well, two, uh, two different clocks. This year is the oscillator. This here is the APB and this here is the Exibus. So the Exibus is also something that, you know, connects various components on the board. Um, there was also turning off the Exibus and then on again uh, for the DDR controller uh, somewhere in the code. I'm not sure why um, they did that in a previous implementation and you would also, so yeah, but it's no longer there. So yeah, we can actually as well get rid of this. So yeah, now come the, um, you know, the, the big functions, so to say. So let's take a look at those because those will get very interesting. So the first thing, um, they call it train. And what train is getting passed is this here. This is a base address, which is part of the DDR5. And the DDR5, um, that is an interesting thing. It actually consists of three different blocks. And this is something I got wrong at a few points where it really confused me. So let's ha have a quick look at those definitions here. There are those three. So there is the DDR5 base, that is one three and then lots of zeros. And now offset by hex 2000 is the DDR5 controller base. And then at offset 4000 is the AC base. AC is for address and command. If you want to read about this address command thing, well, uh, I suggest looking at this page here. Um, this is from Synopsys, uh, you know, another uh, maker for, uh, you know, different peripheral blocks and so on. And well, they describe something uh, here. Uh, address, uh, address, address, slash command this year, commonly abbreviated as AC. Yeah, uh, this article is uh, about DDR hardening. I'm not exactly sure what this means at that point. Um, yeah, just, you know, if, if you want to take a deeper look, uh, 
and how DDR works in general, or you know, DRAM and all, all that stuff. Um, well, this here is, is a bit of a teaser, uh, but if you want to see something more, you can uh, look at uh, what uh, Ono Mutlo is doing. Uh, so he's teaching at the uh, ETH in Zurich. It's a very, very well-known university. They do a lot of technical stuff. And, uh, well, I will put all of those links here in the show notes as usual, right? So, yeah, you can look that up and uh, go very, very deep into, well, computer architecture and what he's uh, teaching. Yeah, you can see all of that down here. Anyway, um, not going further into details right here. Uh, you know, just for a reference so that you have a bit of an understanding what those things here mean. So, yeah, in this instance, we're using the DDR5 control base register. So this is what we had at offset 2000. If we look at that function, well, it's taking something called train data and it's writing all of that train data uh, into, well, the memory space. So this is where, uh, you know, the block is. And uh, how does that work? Well, we just iterate over the uh, data and then for, for each entry, well, we, we take the respective value and we also get the um, iterator index here. I'm not sure if we can also change the index to be uh, scaled up or something. Anyway, uh, we need to do something with this number. So it is also down here. We shift it by two. Uh, in other words, we're multiplying by four. And why is that? Uh, that is because we write 32 bit values or four byte values at a time. So this is why we have to multiply by four because one of these addresses is always you know for uh it's it's always a, a, an address for eight bytes essentially but you can write more than just eight bytes at a time so yeah that is what we're doing here so we say write 32 we write 32 bits at a time to the respective address that we just uh, stitch together here and then we put the respective value there uh yeah i, I, I did something here so I created a function which you know dumps you um, any block from memory. Uh, I was doing that uh, for debugging at some point, uh, but yeah, we don't really need that anymore, so we can also remove this. Let's have a look at train data uh, very roughly. So train data is this giant thing here. You can see it's 363 entries long, right? So yeah, if you want to get an understanding of all of those values here, uh, I would encourage you to look at our previous implementation for the uh, for the JH7100 SOC because that is already you know uh, filled with comments that I also copied over from Uboot. Um, it's also a part of the pull request here, and well, it explains you what all of these registers here mean. The thing is, you know, to really understand this, you know, <laughs> we're talking about hundreds of registers here. Um, you would still need to learn more about like DRAM or DDR con or DRAM controllers in general to, to really make sense of it. Otherwise, you know, you <laughs> you would just um, get a, a bunch of acronyms and stuff. So yeah, that is happening in the train function. And after the train function, well, we enter this here, the util function. And the util function is something uh, which I could actually optimize quite a lot compared to the U-boot code that allowed us to get to a much, much smaller binary that we run. So just an aside here, our current binary code size is 24 kilobytes. In comparison, uh, the U-boot code is currently 128 kilobytes and it's almost all used, so there's not much padding in there. And what does that mean? Well, we currently use only uh, a fifth of the size, actually. So yeah. Um, this is how the function is defined and well here you can see some of the tweaks i did so first of all uh, we need to write another big chunk of data it's not too uh, huge we can look at that um, it's called util data 2. i just retained that sort of uh, from the uboot code so uh, this is writing so first of all it's, it's writing the later uh, registers i don't know why it could also be that this isn't really necessary. You know, I already just copied what Uboot did here. So this util data is another 139 registers being written. Uh, you know, it, it's quite a bit. I think I accidentally pasted something here, right? 
So yeah, it's, it's this mouse. We, we had this earlier as well. So yeah, it's all of this data here. You see quite some repetitions, but yeah, it's it's not really... Um, yeah, we, we could maybe optimize this here a bit as well, but yeah, you know, I, I think it's not really worth it. Um, but there are a few other things that need to happen now. So after all of that stuff is written, um, there is one special value. Uh, oh, sorry. There. Uh, there is, uh, no, still further down, here. Now, now come the special part. So, yeah, this is where we have some special values that we need to pass on. So you just uh, very briefly saw the functions that I extracted. So there are now uh, two uh, kinds of things that we need to write. So I, I just called them data1 and, well, uh, data 1a and data 1b because I you know don't really want to uh, you know give that a, a more sensible name because you know I, I don't really understand that stuff myself I was really just grouping everything and these are each 256 entries again so if we put this all together this year is 1024 entries and this year another 756 so yeah it is quite a bit again no, 768. Yeah, that would be it. Anyway, um, yeah, quite a lot of values. Uh, so, yeah, this is something uh, where I could really shave off quite a bunch of code. So, if, if you look at this here, essentially, it is always writing the same data. There is only one bit that actually needs to be different for the first, well, the, the first and the third entry here. Uh, or block here, and now the second and the fourth, uh, they have it in common, but otherwise, you know, it's really just all the same. So let's look at this function here. Well, it's taking this block, it's writing that first, then it's writing this uh, one value that we pass down, and then it's writing this here, uh, the second block, and that's it. So in the uboot code, you would see this here four consecutive times, plus lots of zeros in between because you also need to write another hundred and I don't know how many 120 or something uh, zeros just after it. It might actually be that this isn't even necessary and uh, you know there is actually not anything behind this. Um, you know I, I guess they're just doing it so that they can just iterate over all of it. Well in a similar fashion we have uh, the second part here um, I'm not going uh, too much into details right here. It's the same sort of thi uh, thing in a sense. Uh, it's just now we need to you know, pass on three values that differ among those uh, three blocks, which are otherwise the same though. So yeah, um, putting that aside again, let's go back here. Now comes the start function. So for the start function, this is not interesting. Now we actually pass two base addresses, the controller base, just like here, and the AC base. So, well, we need to juggle with the two a bit. So, yeah, this is now divided into a few chunks. So there is this here, configuration zero, there is configuration one, and then a few others. Well, and we need to sort of alternate between writing to the AC base address or writing to the controller base address. I'm not sure why that is the case, but yeah, it is what it is. Um, I also had these uh, debug print uh, statements in here, uh, which also appear to be unnecessary. So we might as well get rid of that as well, right? So let's uh, remove all of this stuff here. Um, yeah. All right. Less code is always a bit better. So yeah, uh, now we have, uh, you know, a very, very small chunk again remaining of code. So this is really just, it's five lines to, you know, iterate over a range of values and, you know, doing something with them. They need a slightly different treatment than what we saw before, but otherwise, you know, it's it's a very similar pattern. Anyway, um, yeah. So yeah, as you can see, we're uh, doing quite a lot here. Uh, there are also things I uh, actually extracted from, you know, in, in the U-boot code, it was also like, uh, one or two, like also, you know, giant, giant uh, table style sort of um, uh, definitions. Uh, I really took everything apart a bit so that we could just 
explicitly pass on either a C base or uh, the controller base uh, because first of all it is much much easier to understand this way and second we can get rid of a lot of logic that is otherwise in, in a function that was you know iterating over this large block in the uboot code that would look at like certain different flags and you know depending on this or that you know it would uh, apply a different uh, operation or it would apply to a different uh, base register and so on. So yeah, that was very confusing. So as you can see, we really do a bit of ping pong. Um, so yeah, this year is writing to a C base, but this year is applying a mask and then writing a value. Uh, well, you know, you need to have the OR operator then. Well, in this instance here, we also use a C base but we write the value directly. So we just overwrite what's in the register. And you know, th this is why we uh, just have a, have a few different blocks. Yeah, in instead of having all of this logic. Yeah. It's not too much as you can see. It effectively, it's now eight blocks that we start at zero. That would be, well, it's nine blocks, but yeah, whatever. It's, it's really not that much. So yeah, this is still a bit more comprehensible. And now comes the very tricky part. And this is what I got horribly wrong. We need to write the value one to the DDR5 base register. And well, we might actually as well pass this down here now. And let's actually do that now. Let's do a bit of refactoring. So we'll call this DDR5 base, right? And then we will put this also in the signature here. Uh, well, let's just call it phi base. It's a U size. Let's just call it Firebase. That is enough. So, yeah. You need to write this value one to it. I think this is like saying, hey, we're ready now. Yeah. We don't have documentation for this part, so we can't really tell, uh, but I think that is the case. Well, maybe we will find something in the predecessor code. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, so let us jump back here. So now it says it's expecting three arguments. And so we put our Firebase in here as well. Yeah, so now it's clear that we're actually using uh, these four. All right. Now, before we do the actual training, uh, we need to set the clock down again to, uh, to oscillator divided by two. And now we can actually do, you know, what includes the training and a few other things. So I will make another change now. I will now pass down this uh, phi base again uh, to this here, and I will show you why, because we actually also need it in that code. Um, and so I will also say phi base in here, and this will be a U size. Um, so wh what do we do here? Well, we, we don't really know actually. So there is um, this here to the configuration base uh, address. We need to write this value one. Uh, it could actually be, maybe that was also a confusion and it wasn't actually the uh, configuration base address, but the file base address that, that needed to be written to. Um, I will look that up. Yeah. Anyway, we might as well just write it this way. That's a bit easier to read. It's really just writing a single one. Um, and then, well, we write some uh, chunks of configuration again. So there is this part. Uh, there is one called zero, one, uh, two, three, somewhere, four. You know, in, in this instance, it's it's five. Uh, well, starting at zero, so it's it's, it's six different uh, blocks that we need to write here. Also, a bit easier to you know just split them apart instead of uh, having this logic and yeah. So yeah, that is happening here. So what is uh, the configuration zero part? Well, it's really just a handful of values. Um, if you want to look at where this came from, it's the DDRCSR function, uh, well, underscore boot. That is the C file in the uboot code. I always put comments here so that you can, you know, look at the uboot code for reference and, you know, compare. All right. Um, there's this here now, and this is where you see where I hard coded the uh, size 4G thing here. So for us, it's uh, four gigabytes on the board that I have. Um, now we need to write to a different base address again, you know, do, do some uh, whatever this here is. <laughs> uh, 
um, and then we need to write to those registers, which again, we don't know what they are. Uh, then we need to write another block here. So this is where you saw this uh, CFG1 thing. Um, we might as well actually remove that because yeah, it doesn't really tell us much right now. Um, and now comes the interesting part. So I called this fancy register because I don't really know what it does. Uh, but apparently you need to write something to it. And then you need to wait for another bit in the same register to be set instead. So this one would be cleared and, you know, one, one bit next to it would be set. So four and eight, that just means one more bit to the left, right? And so the question is, um, well, why, uh, why wasn't that working before? Because this is actually where I was struggling and it cost, it cost me a lot of time to figure it out. Well, that was exactly because of this, um, uh, what we saw in the other file just uh, a, uh, a few minutes ago, uh, where I wasn't writing this uh, number one to the right base address. So yeah, I, I really got confused when I looked at the U-boot code because you know they're using like uh, different ways to express the offset or the shift sometimes. Sometimes it's shifting back and forth and you know things like that, calling into different nested macros and so on. That was really, really messy. So yeah, it took quite a while. But hey, we're there now and it works. Um, yeah, this is the uh, this is this uh, init zero timeout thing or whatever it is. Um, I, I'm not actually sure what that means. Oh, well, as well, just remove it because it might just confuse people when they see it. Um, just like the CKE thing. Uh, all I can see is, so I just retained the comments also from uh, you would or well, the previous implementation. This here is for uh, setting up a voltage ramp and then you need to wait for the voltage to raise. And this is why we need to have these timeouts here. I'm not sure what this here is doing exactly, to be honest. Um, yeah, well, uh, here we, we may as well just uh, write zero and one in, in, a, in a short notation like this here. You know, uh, not even sure if fancy rec2 is used in other places. No, it's not. So yeah, I uh, factored out a few hard-coded values and put them uh, in, in constants up there. Uh, yeah, because, you know, that was that was sort of uh, some parts that I was struggling with. Now here come some configuration values. Again, I'm not exactly sure why or whatever we need here. I guess this is for the two gigabyte version. Um, I left a comment here that maybe for the 16 gigabytes version, we need to skip it because I think in the previous implementation, it was also, uh, it was just not used. And that is where we actually had 16 gigabytes of memory. Um, yeah, this is where it's saying drive the CKE high, whatever that is again, could be clock something, but I'm not sure. Um, well, and uh, whatever value here, uh, we need to write that to that register, then we need to write to this register again, and so on. Um, it needs another short delay. Well, uh, it says two microseconds, I have four in here. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. It was also a bit different between the um, uh, the U-boot code for the JH7110 and the code that we had for the predecessor SLC, they were very, very, very similar, but also, you know, sometimes those uh, timeouts uh, were different, for example, or those delays actually. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, we need to write a bit more configuration again, wait a bit, uh, you know, write to those registers again. If you look at those, uh, those are the same ones, 0010, 0014. 10, 14, 10, 14, 10, 14. No idea what it means. Anyway, when all that is done, uh, is done, we need to write a zero to, uh, well, this offset here, 514. Um, I could also put that in a variable like here. Uh, there is also 518 down here. Well, let's actually do that. Let's call it a uh, fancy, fancy reg three, because that would make sense, right? So we have const fancy fancy reg three is the u size. It gets the value that we just cut out five one four. So yeah, that is just uh, before this year. So yeah, all of those here are uh, you know um, they are like next to each other sort of. 
uh, or very close to each other. But still, we don't really know what they mean. Yeah, now, uh, after this here is done, um, the, there is some polling here. So what this is polling for, I think, is also some sort of readiness indicator. And when it's done, uh, yeah, I wrote this here might actually be unnecessary. Well, let's, uh, let's comment it out and see. Um, yeah reducing the comments a bit. Anyway, then we can now do this uh, train thing. And for train, well, again, we need to uh, we need to pass the uh, DDR5 base register. I also got it wrong here. Now that we actually pass it to our function here, we can also use this because you know we're, we're now passing it up here, right? Uh, well, and we need a very specific register, namely this one. Um, that is also the one that we uh, needed to wait on just before. So yeah, it, it seems to indicate something. So what does the train function do again? The train function, that is now talking uh, to the DDR5. So the DDR5 has something where you can just write to it and, uh, or, or you, you read from it. And depending on what you read, um, you know, it, it will tell you what you would need to do. And well, there are those uh, match statements here. So depending on whether we get 0, 1, or 2, uh, that would tell us that we need to change the clock to oscillator divided by 2, PLL divided by 8, or by 4. Really just copied over from U-Boot. Uh, it was also very similar in our previous implementation. We were just using different clock rates, I think. Um, yeah, whatever that means. Uh, yeah, th this here is for verbose debugging. That was also in the U-Boot code, so I guess they were also experimenting a bit with it. I can't really tell. Anyway, um, yeah, and then we need to uh, write something. I think this is like an acknowledgement bit like, hey, uh, you know, we just changed the clock and then you can uh, do something again. And then uh, the file or the controller or whatever, <laughs> they would need to do something again. And then we just, uh, you know, get back in this loop here. Then we would read something again and so on until we're done. So when we're done, uh, this is where we get this comment, omc init phi. This is where we write to the file control base again. Well, and uh, here you can actually see this here. So this is now 84 shifted by two. So first of all, this is now a decimal number, right? And we're doing this shift by two. So this is like um, using the number of the register. Uh, so instead in, in all these other instances here, uh, we were just uh, given these offsets. So yeah, I also just uh, took that from the translation. Um, now let's do the following. Uh, let's let's put that in a comment here. Uh, 83 shifted by 2. And uh, instead, let's actually write this value in, uh, in hexadecimal and also already apply the shift. So 48 shifted by 2 is 336 and well in hex you, you see i already did this uh, that would be 150 so this is ox150 right so now we don't really need to calculate this here because it would just be the next number so we just add four to the previous value so we get uh, this here so yeah this is 84 shifted by two well, uh, we can also put that here and off we go. All right, I'm not even sure why they were uh, reading this here. Um, we, we don't need to assign that to a value even. I'm, I'm not sure why this is happening here. It's, you know, really just something I copied over. Um, yeah, it might trigger something to read from a register. That can actually happen in hardware. We had uh, discovered that on, uh, when we were working with a vision 5.1, right? So yeah, then again, uh, we need to write a bunch of configurations, uh, whatever this is. Um, yeah, I, I thought this might be for secondary, but it is actually for uh, security. I'm, I'm not even sure how that is related to security, to be honest. Uh, yeah, and then we need to write a few other values. And then finally, uh, the initialization of the DRAM is done. And after that, so what we did for the predecessor SOC was 
um, we were uh, running a few DRAM tests. So yeah, I didn't really do this in, uh, in this implementation now. Uh, we, we could still copy that over and do some more tests, like right to, you know, different spots in memory and see if it's all fine. Um, but so far, you know, I copied over payloads. I was running code already from DRAM. So it seemed that all is good. Anyway, so yeah, um, now you had a walkthrough of how all of this uh, DRAM init stuff works, right? So yeah, if, if we jump back again after this here, uh, let's get back to the DRAM RS file here. You know, after this big function is run, uh, we're saying DRAM init is done and then we are all good and we just run our payload. So now let's do the following because we made a few changes actually. Um, let us run the new code. So I'm turning off the board again. You know, we didn't really make any um, changes that should be meaningful. So yeah, everything should still work, uh, except we got a few things wrong. So what did we get wrong here? Um, function defined here. Oh, right. I didn't save the file. That happens. All right. And I, uh, I guess I had a typo, DDR start RS. So uh, let's look at the start function. Oh, typo here. I call it for base instead of Firebase. All right, there we go. Yeah, compiling is very quick here. Um, oh, you see, <laughs> it already just worked. So it was really that fast right now. And uh, yeah, that's it for today. Um, with that, thank you very, very much. I hope I could, uh, you know, show you a bit uh, how this uh, whole thing works now. So from uh, what I have uh, so far understood. Um, so uh, just just for recap, um, I want to look at the uh, definitions of the constants again, because this is, um, you know, where, where it gets a bit interesting. So this is in source init. So the DRAM controller consists of well, we actually have two parts. So we have the DRAM controller. It has this first part, and then we have its uh, security part or whatever it means. Those are two base addresses that we needed. And then there are three more. One of them is just the file base address. Then there is something called the file control or controller and the file AC for address and command. And that's it. So yeah. Um, we could also draw a diagram maybe at some point, uh, but yeah, that should be it for now. Um, with that, thank you very, very much again. And uh, yeah, next time we will see that we uh, start our SBI implementation. Um, yeah, that will take a while again as well. I will, uh, you know, see that I prepare a few things. So there were some changes in the Rust SBI library that I need to read into also. And well, I will be at a few more uh, events now. So. Uh, tomorrow and <laughs> the next day we have a local security conference that I'm visiting and then there will be you know a, a week that I'm just uh, you know taking off and yeah then I will come back again and uh, see that we do another live stream so that could be maybe I don't know in two and a half weeks or something anyway so yeah uh, take care everyone and see you next time goodbye